Whenever there's a separation of electric charge, there exists an electric dipole. And so let's see exactly what that means by looking at this diagram. So let's suppose we have two electric charges that have equal quantity of charge, but are opposite in signs. So we have a negatively charged point charge given by negative Q and a positive charge given by positive Q. Now these charges are separated by this given by lowercase l. Now in such a case an electric dipole will exist. So we say that an electric dipole is created by the combination of equal but opposite electric charges that are separated by a certain distance. In this case it's given by l. Now Whenever we have an electric dipole, we define the electric dipole moment of that particular electric dipole as the product of the charge Q and the distance L between our two charges. So notice the Q in both of these cases is exactly the same because they have the same equal quantity of charge. So this is known as the electric dipole moment and it's denoted by lowercase p. Now this happens to be the same exact symbol for linear momentum, but you should not confuse electric dipole moment and momentum because these are completely different concepts. Now, notice that our electric dipole moment is a vector. It has magnitude as well as direction. Now, the convention in, in physics is as follows. Our electric dipole moment begins on the negative side and ends on the positive side. So in physics, our electric dipole moment in this case would point in this direction, in the positive direction along the x-axis. Now, on the other hand, in chemistry, this convention is reversed. In chemistry, the electric dipole moment begins on the positive end and ends on the negative side. So in chemistry, the electric dipole moment would point in the negative direction along our x-axis for this particular case. Now, in this lecture, we're going to stick to the physics notation, to the physics convention. Now, let's examine one particular application of the electric dipole and the electric dipole moment in nature. So where do electric dipoles exist? Well, one particular example are molecules. Let's examine the following neutral molecule. This is a carbon monoxide molecule composed of two atoms. We have a carbon and we have an oxygen. Now, the overall net charge on this molecule will be zero, but notice the oxygen will be more electronegative than the carbon. And that means the oxygen pulls the electrons closer to itself than the carbon. And that means because of this difference in electronegativity, our electrons will spend more time on the oxygen atom than on the carbon atom. And that means we're going to develop a small negative charge on the oxygen atom and the small positive charge on the carbon atom. And now we have a separation of equal but opposite charges. And even though the overall net charge is zero, there will be an electric dipole and also an electric dipole moment, which will point from the right to the left, from the negative to the positive. Once again, in chemistry, this will be reversed. In chemistry, the electric dipole moment will begin on the positive side and will end on the negative side. So once again, oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. And electrons generally spend more time on the oxygen than they do on the carbon. And as a result, there will be a small negative charge on the oxygen and a small positive charge on the carbon. And this separation of equal but opposite charges will create an electric dipole. And such a molecule that has an electric dipole is called a polar molecule. Now, 
Recall whenever we have an electric charge and we place that electric charge into an electric field, that electric charge will feel a force as a result of that electric field. And the force is given by the product of the charge and the electric field. So let's suppose we take an electric dipole and we place it into a uniform electric field as shown in the following diagram. So an electric dipole as shown is placed into an external electric field that points from the right to the left and is constant. So the electric field lines are shown by the following light blue arrows. Now this is our electric dipole. We have a negative charge given by one and a positive charge given by two. And the distance between them is given to be L. So we define this to be the X axis and this to be the Y axis. And the angle that this line L makes with with respect to the x-axis is given by this angle theta. Now notice what will begin to happen when we place our electric dipole into our electric field. This electric field will create a force on each one of these point charges. So the force on this charge, because it's negative, will point in the opposite direction of the electric field. So the force here will point in this direction. On the other hand, because we have a positive charge, the force as a result of the electric field on charge number two will point in the same direction as the electric field. So we have one force going this way, the second force going this way, and because these two forces are equal in opposite, opposite, the net force will be zero. The net force on our electric dipole will be zero. And that's because we assume these two charges have the same exact quantity of charge. Now, even though the net force on this electric dipole will be zero, there will be a net torque. The net torque will point in the clockwise direction. So the force will push it this way, this force will push it this way, and our electric dipole will tend to rotate in the clockwise direction. So the net dipole or the net torque on our electric dipole is given by summing up our two torques which point in the same clockwise direction. So we choose clockwise to be positive. So recall that torque is given by the product of the lever arm and our force. So let's begin with charge number one. The force on charge number one is given by F1 and the lever arm is given by L divided by 2 multiplied by sine of the angle theta. Where we choose L divided by 2 because we choose our axis of rotation to lie directly in the middle. Now for charge number 2 we have F2 which is the force acting on charge 2 as a result of the field multiplied by the lever arm. Now, our forces F1 and F2 are exactly the same because the charge is the same. So that means we replace F1 and F2 with Q multiplied by E because the force within an electric field is given by the product of the charge and that electric field. So, now we have the same two quantities, we sum these quantities up and we get the following result. So our net torque on our dipole within this electric field is equal to the product of the charge, the distance between them L, multiplied by the electric field, multiplied by the sine of the angle theta. Now we define Q multiplied by L as the electric dipole moment of our electric dipole. So we replace Q multiplied by L with P. And we see that the torque on our electric dipole is given by the vector product of the electric dipole moment and the electric field. So the electric field will tend to orient the dipole so that it is parallel to that field.
So our torque will be in the clockwise direction and it will continue to move until our negative charge is on this side and the positive charge is on this side. And it will stop moving when this distance L is parallel with respect to the electric field. Now when our electric field creates a force that acts on our electric dipole and moves it, the electric field does work on our electric dipole. Now how much work is required by the electric field to twist our dipole? Now when we spoke about torques and work, we said that the work is equal to the integral of the product of the torque and the infinitely small change in our angle, where we integrate from our initial angle, angle 1, to our final angle, angle 2. Now, notice we can replace torque with the following equation, but this should have a negative sign here because we're choosing our angle to decrease. So this becomes negative and we replace our torque with the following equation. So we have work is equal to negative of the integral P times E times sine theta multiplied by D theta from theta 1 to theta 2. So, notice our P and our E are constants, so we can bring those out of our integral, we can solve and evaluate our integral, and we get the following equation. The work is equal to P times E multiplied by cosine theta 2 minus cosine theta 1, where theta 1 is the initial angle and theta 2 is the final angle. Now, recall the relationship between potential energy and work. So the change in potential energy of our electric dipole is equal to the work that is done by that electric dipole. So what this basically means is when our electric field does work on this electric dipole, it is transferring potential energy into our electric dipole. So, we arbitrarily choose our electric potential energy of this electric dipole to be zero when the angle is 90. So when our electric dipole is perpendicular with respect to the electric field, when the angle is equal to 90, the potential energy within that electric dipole is defined to be zero. Now using that choice, we see that the potential energy is equal to negative W, which is equal to negative uh, the product of our electric dipole moment P, our electric field E, and the cosine of the angle theta. So that basically means is when our electric dipole is perpendicular, it has no potential energy, but when it's parallel, it has a maximum amount of potential energy because cosine of the angle 90 is 0 and cosine of the angle 0 is 1. So, this is how much potential energy that can be stored in our electric dipole as a result of its orientation with respect to our electric field. So once again, our electric field does work on our electric dipole when it orients it parallel with respect to the electric field. So it's transferring energy into our electric dipole and it's storing that energy in terms of potential energy. Energy.